Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute Fall Lunch and Learn Lecture Series. My name is Paige Shi, Strategic Partners Officer for the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute, also known as GTMI. GTMI is part of the larger Georgia Tech research enterprise that includes 11 interdisciplinary research institutes. GTMI focuses on manufacturing research, development, and deployment designed to address the grand challenges of today's manufacturers. And we assist our partner organizations with internal and external move innovations from the lab to the marketplace. GTMI has a wide array of facilities and equipment located on main campus for basic research and nearby on 14th Street for applied research in our advanced manufacturing pilot facility. Our mission includes education and workforce training, collaborative partnerships with industry, academia, and government, and thought leadership. Each semester, GTMI hosts a Lunch and Learn series. Today's lecture is the final lecture of the fall semester. These lectures are excellent opportunities for Georgia Tech faculty, students, and researchers, as well as a global manufacturing community to learn and share advanced manufacturing knowledge. During today's presentation, all audience members are automatically muted to ensure a smooth presentation experience. However, we encourage you to use the chat feature to submit any comments to the speaker and the Q&A panel to submit any questions for the speaker that we'll address at the end of today's lecture. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce Chris Boschers, who will present Life at the Edge, Research and Development as a Way of Life. Mr. Boschers serves as Director of Emerging Technologies at Lockheed Martin. In this role, Chris coordinates research and development activity in the areas of advanced manufacturing technologies, materials and processes, and model-based engineering research. This research portfolio supports the development of critical technology across all business areas and products at Lockheed Martin, including space, aeronautics, missiles, and rotary systems. Prior to this role, Chris served as Senior Director and Chief Engineer for Spirit Aerosystems Defense Division. In this role, Chris led technical development activity during Spirit Aerosystems' transition from a purely commercial manufacturer to a significant defense contractor with over $600 million in annual revenue. His technical leadership activity on V-280s, CH-53K, and classified defense projects established Spirit as a solid defense aerostructures performer. In his 30 plus years of experience in the aerospace industry, Chris has performed a variety of roles, including stress analysis of composite metallic structures, development of FAA approved material allowables, and development of innovative strength prediction software tools for aerospace structures. Chris has extensive experience in research and development he was part of the R&D teams at both Lockheed Martin and Boeing. He supported development of the F-22 and was part of the team evaluating thermal protection systems for the NASAP, NASP hypersonic vehicle. Boschers holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Aerospace Engineering from the University of Tennessee and a Master of Science degree in Engineering Mechanics from Virginia Tech. Welcome, Mr. Boschers. You may begin your presentation. All right, thank you, Paige. Um, and thank you, uh, um, faculty and students and guests. Um, very excited to be here and very, very uh, pleased to get the chance to speak with everyone. So the topic of the talk, um, research and development is a way of life. It's a um, an attempt really to, to talk about how R&D isn't, isn't a skill code. It's not a, it's not a job title. It really should be kind of a mindset that um, all of us in engin as engineers uh, could benefit from. And um, so, so in, in the talk today, I'm going to explore a little bit of, of my background and, and bring and bring up some examples, at least one major significant exa example that kind of illustrates uh, and exemplifies that that mindset. And uh, then we'll talk a little bit about certain certain strategies around uh, you know reinforcing that that R&D mindset, and then we'll kind of deep dive into Current, um, you know, topics of uh, of of R and D, um, you know, you know, topics that uh, Lockheed Martin is um, is looking at. So, so with that, um, I'll, I'll get started. And, and I'd like to start, if we could, with um, just a little bit of audience participation. I, I know we can only do chat. So, in, in the event chat window, um, you know, Lockheed Martin is probably is the world's largest defense contractor. Um, we, we build and, and maintain hundreds of, of products for uh, defense, comp defense um, you know, uh, countries um, around the world. Uh, so if, if you could, um, 
maybe in the chat window type in what you believe is the most iconic um, Lockheed Martin product. You know, we built so many different types of helicopters and aircraft. And if you could just um, add in what what you know a product that you believe is most representative or just comes to mind when you think of Lockheed Martin, what that um, what that product is, what that airplane is, what that missile is, what that hel helicopter is. So if, if you wouldn't mind, just go ahead and putting in the, in the chat window. Okay, I see F-35 from Gary. Um, you know, while you guys are thinking, CH-53K is a good one. Yeah. Um, C-5, right? Oldie, oldie but goodie. And those are those all are all um, ooh, C2 BMC. Excellent. F35. F35, right? Patriot from Ben. Lockheed Martin, and keep go ahead and keep adding in. I'll 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 add a little bit of color. Lockheed Martin um, is comprised of four business areas. We'll cover this later, but um, it's it's a company that's accreted from many smaller companies over over the years, and so there's a wide variety of of different products that um, that are built, and some of them are legacy, and some of them have been been developed in recent years. Okay, so for F-35, and 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 that would be my choice as well. When I think about Lockheed Martin, I think about F-35. Um, it's um, you know probably one of the largest, if not the largest, um, defense project ever it's it's a it's a intended to eventually produce thousands of of air vehicles um, for both the United States and our allies so now then the second part of this um, little exercise for the f-35 in particular what would be the one adjective um, that you would describe uh, for the f-35 and um, I'm looking for one in particular that I think will come up but I'm curious to see so if you could think of just one one word to describe the F-35, uh, what would that be? And if we don't get it right, I'll I'll supply the correct answer. <laughs> Fast. Good. Any others? Innovative, high tech, innovative. Boondoggle. Excellent. Okay, so um, I'll pick Boondoggle. I was, uh, I think that's close to what I was looking for, um, and that's not surprising to me. I would have would have said expensive or costly, um, and it is a very expensive uh, vehicle. So uh, I, I recently joined Lockheed Martin after um, a, a role at Spirit Aero Systems, which is the for, former Boeing division in Wichita, Kansas. Um, and and one of my jobs, in fact, my only job really there was in the last uh, few years was to grow the defense uh, arm of Spirit. And and we we did so by emphas emphasizing our ability to produce affordable products. And, um, and and when uh, Lockheed Martin brought me on board, it was really, I think, in, in, to, to essentially help out in that area, is to help use advanced manufacturing technologies, new materials and processes, new engineering tools to um, make those um, make Lockheed Martin products more more affordable for for our our customers. And and the reason I've had success. In the past, in doing that, um, and, and I can point to a number of, of things here, but here, this is kind of interesting. Uh, my, my background is a little bit interesting to, su to support that, and I'll kind of highlight a few things here. I, I went back and counted, um, and I think I've been involved in something like 25 different um, aircraft development projects in, in some way over the past 35 or so years. Here's a few of them here. If we start in the upper right, that um, that's the 787, which was the first mostly composite um, air, air commercial air vehicle um, brought to market. 
Um, the F-22, if I go clockwise there, the F-22 is shown there. The uh, 737 Next Generation, which we've which we've all flown on uh, before. Uh, CH-53K, um, I, I was responsible for the team that designed and built the fuselage and still continues to build the fuselage at Spirit. Uh, A350 um, did a lot of work on the wing. And then the uh, uh, Bell V280, which is still a, that was a, a flying demonstrator, um, which is uh, going to be competed in, in coming years between Bell and, and Lockheed Martin. Over the years, I started off as in structural research group at McDonnell Douglas uh, right out of college. I went to general dynamics in, 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 in composites. My background has mostly been composites work. Um, uh, I'm a stress analyst primarily, but uh, mostly with with focused on on composite materials. Um, went back into R and D in in at Lockheed um, in the mid in the early 90s. Uh, moved moved as a structural analyst to Boeing. Became part of the research and te technology group at Spirit. Uh, back into a um, a product development role as chief engineer and director at Spirit, and then most recently came here as director of emerging technologies, which is really leading a pretty high-powered um, R&D group. And, and what I found interesting about this background was that um, the, the research uh, R&D uh, kept coming up, and it was a, it was cyclical. So um, I, I found myself going back and forth in, into into from from research and then into a product support or development or uh, a managerial role, but it's been interesting that the R and D, um, you know, uh, title or responsibility has 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 followed me throughout my career, and I and I don't think that's too terribly different than a lot of a lot of people, a lot of engineers in in aerospace and probably in other areas too. So so that became kind of the genesis for this uh, discussion, is that. Um, R&D is something that I, I believe we we always need to think about as being part of our responsibility to 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 our um, you know whatever job it is that we're we're trying to do, and and bringing in that sort of a mindset I think makes our makes us more effective, makes us successful at designing new products, at supporting um, you know new manufacturing processes. At identifying um, improvements to a, a product or a process or a thing that we're responsible for. So, so that's the that's the central premise here is that um, having this mindset, uh, having this research and development mindset, is advantageous uh, to us. So, to to illustrate, I, I thought I'd, I'd kind of deep dive into one one project that uh, I, I had a small team. That was that I was faced with um, several years back, and it started off pretty much in a way that was uh, I wouldn't call research, and it ended up in a way that I think most definitely would be. So it's kind of interesting, and I thought I could just share a little bit about what was going on. So so um, I was in a product development role and leading a small team, and and we basically got alerted from uh, one of our our programs that was building a new product uh, for a commercial aircraft. Um, it was a it was the front spar for a of a, a commercial airliner, uh, which was made out of composites, and it was the first time that we had applied um, advanced fiber placement technologies to a to a, a composite spar. The picture that you see here is really an, uh, an inspection uh, tool, uh, a piece of equipment, but. But the spar that you see there is the outboard section uh, of the spar, um, and you can see it's it's got a, a kind of a C shape to the to the spar. Um, the the in, it, the inner segments, which are it was comprised of three segments, the innermost segment was pretty pretty big, uh, up to two meters in in depth at the at the root. So it's a it was a big composite part. Um, you know, spars are a pretty important part of any aircraft structure. They form part of the wing torque box, so any kind of bending or twisting on the wing has to be reacted by the by the uh, by the spars. They primarily carry shear in the webs. They're very highly loaded, 
Um, um, in this case, it also formed part of the fuel boundary. So there was there was a fuel tank located inside the wing, just like most commercial airliners. And um, and as as a as a fuel boundary, um, it, it meant that there were additional requirements uh, for safety purposes uh, that were levied upon the spar. So in, in particular, um, when in the case where you might have a a hard landing, uh, an emergency stop, that um, when when the pilot applied the brakes on the runway, all the fuel would pile up and push forward against the the front spar and if if that fuel is not contained, if there was a leak, e even on a hard landing or or an emergency landing, then um, a safety flight issue could arise. So it's quite important that the the C-shaped spar remain structurally integral um, during any kind of a you know emergency braking maneuver. And, and what was difficult about that is that with the shape of the spar, that when when the internal um, pressure loads from the fuel piled up, it tried to open the spar, and because composites are weak in, in, uh, with through interlaminar tension and shear, um, it was a real challenge to get the, the required strength right in the corners of the spar. Essentially, the, the C would try to open up, and potentially the spar could delaminate, which could cause, which could result in a leak, which could result in a fire. So it was very important that we meet, met our interlaminar ten, tensile strength requirements. So during the production of the spar, the um, portions of the spar that were that were, were removed during manufacture were tested to ensure that we met minimum strength requirements. And uh, so my team got was alerted that um, everything was fine except for the ILT strength, and that we were coming in um, maybe 80% of what we needed to, and pretty pretty regularly as well. Um, which which caused a lot of consternation. You know, all visual inspections look, didn't show any issues. Um, NDI looked okay. All the other failure modes, all the, you know, tension, compression, um, bearing strengths were all fine and were matching our predictions. When we sectioned the spar, there seemed to be no internal, um, you know, problems. Any anything that was unexpected. So it was kind of a conundrum. And um, the, the, the test that we were using looked something like this, where the, a, a portion of the corner was cut out uh, from around the periphery. Uh, we would just grab it in an MTS machine and pull down on one leg and, and check it against a prediction. Um, there really didn't seem to be any reason why we were having these really low interlaminar ten, tensile strengths. Um, so, so basically, we we got you know my team got the test data and we we started looking at it and plotting it in various various ways um, and one of the first ways we looked at it was simply by plotting it versus time right? when when the test was occurred and for sure enough we we saw that yep there was we definitely weren't meeting the requirement which would have been a one here so we were consistently below but it also looked a little odd that there was a period of time when we saw markedly poor results. Um, so we began to try to piece out what was going on there, and we and we found that, uh, so this is a clue. This is the kind of the first clue. Uh, we found that one of the um, pieces of equipment used to produce the specimen was broken uh, for, for a, a short time period, and it just happened to correlate with the time period where we got poorer results. And we went and looked at the specimens and found that there was a difference in the edge quality of those particular specimens. So, okay, that's kind of an interesting clue. Uh, the next thing we did is looked at the failed specimens and um, to, to make sure that they were failing properly. And uh, so our, our predicted, um, you know, lo failure location, we had, had done analyses and knew pretty much where the peak stress would occur um, at, 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 you know, in, in, the, in the radius. And so, it's, you know, it's about halfway, 40% 40, 40 through the, the um, the thickness of the of the spar, but when we went back and looked at at the actual failure initiation locations, um, it it they were fail they were initiating at a quite different location, um, quite a, quite a bit far away from the 40% or so uh, locale 
of, of where that actual failure should have occurred, right? So this was really the second big clue. Um, and, you know, with these two things combined, I think for those of you who are experienced in composites, you probably have an idea what's going on at this point. Um, so, and we did too, we, we suspected. So we built a, a pretty, elab pretty, pretty um, elaborate finite element model. And of course, here's what you expect to get, uh, a peak stress that occurs around four tenths of the way through um, at, at, the, at the center. And, um, and so we, we replicated that with the finite element model. But when we looked at the stresses near the edge of the specimen, we saw something that looked like this, where we had huge uh, interlaminar tensile spikes that were occurring right at the right at the free edge, right near the free edge. And um, um, and then, you know, as as we looked at it and reviewed our our process, we realized, of course, what was going on is that uh, free edge effects were occurring um, at the edge of the laminate, and this has been, you know, pr pretty well known for, for 40, 40 years uh, that, um, you know, for a, a, a laminate with, with uh, that's not just a 090 laminate that you'll have these, these free edge stresses. We didn't realize the magnitude of them for the particular layup that we had. And when we went out and plotted them, uh, we found that they were extremely large and they could, and we were able to correlate those with the actual failure locations. So, um, and then, and then, in terms of the edge quality, what we found is that um, the, um, uh, you know, if we if we happen to have a, uh, oh, thanks, thanks, Gary. Looks like you're. <laughs> um, so, if we happen to have a uh, uh, a microscopic flaw that that was near one of these uh, large stress risers, then uh, we we could. Uh, we would initiate failure a little sooner than than was expected, and so that's that was the dependence on the edge quality uh, that would interact with these these large stresses. So so it was a um, kind of a, an eye opening uh, problem that we were testing. We weren't testing the spar itself; we were testing the quality of the edge. And once we once we realized that, um, you know it 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 kind of changed the complexion of the problem. And we, we communicated this to our customer, and of course they're smart folks and they understood what was happening. And so we were able to change the um, change the strength requirements and uh, to account for these edge effects and, and you know, pretty much resolve the, the problem. But this re, this R&D mentality that, that, that we had, um, we, we took it a little bit further and, and we did, did some testing and some, um, evaluations to show that if we just coated the, the the free edge after machining uh, with with some epoxy, uh, we could improve that um, that failure load quite a bit. So it, you know the the the, um, um, the 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 point here really is that if it had been treated without um, having this this sense of inquiry. Um, you know, it could have been a kind of a, a, a really thorny problem, but just being able to, to use the available data and, and conduct what looks like an R&D project, really, um, I think we were able to improve the, 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 the process and, you know, pretty easily resolve a, a, a problem that, um, that, was, that was really perplexing um, both us and, and our customer. So, so what's what's kind of interesting, um, at least f from that that I, I took away was the sense of 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 the edge, right? I mean, that, in that case, it was really a physical edge that we were testing, but but you you come across, you know, in engineering, we come across edges, in, in different ways. So so many times, um, it 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 just kind of I started noticing this a lot after after that where you know, again, a composite material is is defined. Uh, you know, the properties of it are so dependent upon the interface layer between the composite and the matrix material. Aer aerodynamics, you 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 know, we we the the boundary layer and the the interplay between structures and fluid interactions all occur at a at this at this boundary. Um, you know, interfaces. Um, 
the, the the limits, right? The boundary of the spar and the fuel. All of these all of these boundaries and edges, it seemed to be the place where where we should be looking uh, for, for for problems or ways to improve. And um, it, it it seems like that's a kind of a a uh, you know a touch point for us as to as to where should we start? We should start looking when we when we are faced with an issue or a problem or a research topic. Where where are the where are the boundaries? Where are the limits? Where are the edges? Where are the interfaces? That's kind of uh, has has sort of guided me a little bit in in doing R and D. When we also think about research strategies, um, you know, the example I just went through was. Uh, and it, kind of an example of, of necessity being the mother of, of invention. And we've had discussions about this too internally, being that it seems like uh, a lot of good ideas, a lot of good um, capabilities come out of our programs, not necessarily in the R&D, um, you know, intentional R&D uh, projects that we run, but when people try and solve a, a real problem that they have, it, it, it seems like a really good way to develop research capabilities, you know, develop uh, um, develop new capabilities, and uh, we would a lot of times we'll take those and advance them through through a more formal R and D process, and but it's that, that genesis of a really good idea that comes from from need, oftentimes. Um, you know, road mapping is really the way that, and we're approaching road mapping season at, at Lockheed Martin right now, where we we look. In, into the future, and we try to see what's what's coming and what our needs are, and and those those road mapping and brainstorming sessions are really a lot of fun. Um, they're they're where we try and and come up with what we think we're going to need and what kind of R and D um, solutions to enable certain capabilities that we want to have um, to be able to improve our products or to win new business. Or to to make certain um, you know things more capable, and it, it could be that um, research into optimization is needed. If we if we go back to the F thirty five, the example there where um, you know Bob says it's a boondoggle, um, I think one of the one of the areas that we we need to be able to improve is to optimize and improve. Some existing technologies, and to, to to make them more affordable, to make them more efficient, and that's part of our research and development job as engineers, no matter what our title really is, and that's to optimize um, existing products or processes. There's there's always an argument about um, new capabilities, new processes, new technologies. Sometimes they, there's not a direct connection between a new capability. And uh, what what might come out of it, and 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 so there's there's a little bit of a debate here. If that if if you put it in, into existence, someone will find a, a use for it, and and I've seen that uh, um, that if you if you have a and, and I've seen the opposite too, where we we come up with a great idea and it doesn't seem to seem to work. So um, if you build it, it Will they come? I don't know, but a lot of times in the past it it has worked out. And then finally, this this idea about oblique strategies. Um, I don't know if if everyone is familiar with this term, but um, there was a musician back in the 70s and 80s, Brian Eno, that came up with this term, um, and he uses it as a way to to um, foster creativity in the in the music writing process, and uh, there's it, it's it's a it's a strategy around um, doing things differently in in ways that are can ultimately be constructive and can lead you down different paths that you that that you normally wouldn't have have gone down. And the the illustration I chose for that um, shows an optimization process on the right. Um, I, I find optimization. Um, to be a fascinating topic, and 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 some of the and I and I've written optimization codes in the past, and I found the algorithms to be fascinating. But what's interesting is that all good um, optimization algorithms share one feature, and in that um, 
they allow you to take steps backwards once in a while um, to, to avoid getting captured by local minima. You have to step back and um, in some in some structured way. And uh, so I, I find that to be very interesting and, and sort of a commentary on, on the on the R&D process itself. So 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 those are kind of a, a sort of a stream of consciousness approach to R&D that that um, has been on my mind over the has developed over the past few years and has been a kind of an a, a, a interesting uh, means of developing new capabilities. So I'm going to switch gears um, here and and look a little bit at specifically Lockheed Martin and some of the areas that we're focused on um, in the R&D world. You know, Lockheed Martin, uh, as I said, was one of the largest companies in the world, 114,000 plus employees. It's a global company um, operating in 54 countries. It's predominantly uh, an engineering um, centric company uh, and with extensive facilities worldwide. We, you know, it's, it's, there's a federated business model with Lockheed. It's, it's created over the years from, from various companies that are now grouped into four major business areas. Aer Aeronautics, which is responsible for developing uh, tactical fighters and, and uh, airlift vehicles, F F-35 being the poster child for air, air dynamic, for aeronautics. Uh, missiles and fire control building, um, you know, tactical missiles, um, fire control systems, and energy um, um, storage and creation uh, products. Our RMS division, Rotary and Mission Systems division, um, includes Sikorsky and then other components, both for, for naval solutions, maritime solutions, radars, uh, rotorcraft, and then training and logistics. And then in space, uh, you know, there satellites, uh, global communications, and that includes some of the uh, space exploration and um, uh, and satellite launch capabilities. I, I found this chart to be really interesting from an investment standpoint, uh, to contrasting the DoD and the commercial um, investments. Where does the money go in at a high level in R and D? And um, you know, commercial dwarfs uh, the DoD investment. Although in some in some ways, this accounting I think might be a little bit misleading. Um, but uh, but also the breakdown between um, you know analytics, autonomy, and, and electronics versus materials I, in the commercial world, especially I found I found to be very interesting that that materials and manufacturing still gets the lion's share of of R and D investment. Um, this goes to show that the that the products that we develop are still very important and still are you know ripe for investment and and Need for us to 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 look at with um, you know, very strongly so that we can reduce the cost of these products. Um, one of the the, the in, in, at Lockheed at Lockheed Martin, uh, we've begun this pivot, um, or I don't know if it's a pivot, it's more of a concentration um, in, into an area that's called joint all domain operations. So so this is an area that's getting a lot of investment. Uh, we're putting a lot of, of intent and and effort in, into um, into working on this. What Jado refers to is essentially the ability to connect all of our products, our hundreds of products, and and being able to um, integrate all the sensor data, all the capabilities, all the um, uh, you know uh, features that that they all bring, and interconnect them. And and enable a a, a a a joint a commander a joint force commander to be able to fuse all that data and act upon it pretty much seamlessly. Right now, things are pretty much disjointed, right? Um, where where satellite data might not come in real time to uh, an army commander, right? Or or sensor data from from a ground based system. Uh, might not be able to inform uh, a surface vessel or a submarine as to what's what's going on around it. So the 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 idea here is that um, to streamline all of, all of that data, all of those products, and and being able to use the right 
weapon system and the right set of data uh, to make uh, to to have an effect on on you know during 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 the um, you know during the battle essentially and, and to happen and to have all this happen more more quickly more seamlessly and uh, and be more effective to do that there are certain areas and this is most of these things are outside of my uh, expertise area, but they're all fascinating. Clearly, you've got to be able to secure your communications uh, and keep keep your uh, bad guys out of your systems. Um, the use of directed energy now has become a become a thing, right? Where we can uh, make effects through the use of um, of uh, in energy weapons. Uh, quantum quantum computing, um, you know, it, it enables that advanced um, AI and ML capabilities to, to occur much more quickly in, and in real time. Command and control, microelectronics. Autonomy is a big area now where we can we can have um, low, potentially low cost um, you know un, unmanned vehicles that can operate by themselves and and you know provide data back and uh, and and take action where, where it makes sense. Space is the ultimate high ground and so using using space um, is something that's already happening and will, will occur more in the future. Hypersonics has big, been a big area, um, and that's an area that's in my portfolio now, with regard to being able to um, have make you know have effects happen right more more rapidly and with little warning. So um, an adversary may not may not know what's going to happen until it's too late. And then missile defense, being able to defend, defend our our you know our resources and people against uh, against attack is is very important. So the the JADO functions there, the persistent um, you know intelligence and surveillance uh, converge effects both through high speed weapons and through energy weapons, resi resilient comms, force protection, um, and then and then being able to maintain all the logistics and support. That occur during during uh, the, the the battle is uh, important both from logistics and a battle management perspective. So these are big areas. Uh, the you know these days, a little bit more detail here shows what what you know what these look like. Uh, advanced comms, um, the use of artificial intelligence, and machine machine learning um, is 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 really on on the rise in terms of how it can affect. Um, you know the JADO um, tools that we need to have. Efficient computing. Um, I've I've heard this referred to as computing at the edge, which kind of you know echoes back to my uh, remarks about things happening at the edge. Uh, de defense research. So basic basic research that can improve range, can improve accuracy, uh, can make engines run harder, hotter, um, heat exchangers be more effective. Uh, those kind of uh, defense research uh, areas are, are are extremely important. New new power and propulsion technologies, again, um, you know, more efficient engines and um, different types of of propulsion uh, and different fuels, right, to help sustainability as well as improve performance. The digital transformation. I think every every aerospace and engineering company in the world. Is undergoing some degree of digital transformation right now. It's a means of making us more um, more, more nimble, be able to re reduce cycle times to get products in the field more quickly. So it's a really it's a it's a really important way to optimize our our processes and our supply chain. Autonomy and man to man teaming. Um, it, it's 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 a, it's a smart way of force multiplying. So using a less less expensive less less of a boondoggle um, uh, vehicle that's cheaper to make and and have them work with a a manned vehicle like the F-35 is a is a great way to to um, improve the effectiveness of those expensive platforms. The area that I'm most focused on advanced design, materials, and manufacturing. You know, it, it's it's all about getting the cost out of the F-35 or the other products. Making us able to produce more, to be more, um, uh, you know, efficient and more effective. And then space again, uh, being able to protect protect our our space uh, assets and making them more effective, it, it's a big deal. 
a little bit more detail into the areas that, that most of us on the call here are probably a little more comfortable with. Um, my team is looking a lot at, at in these areas in terms of advanced materials, new, new composite materials that can go to higher temperatures, that are lighter, that um, have characteristics that enable certain things that, that weren't possible before. Use of additive manufacturing, um, it's clearly got some, some great benefits. We're, we're just scratching the surface, I think, of where we're going to be using additive um, in the future. And I'll, I've got some more examples coming up. Uh, Next-gen electronics in, in you know, ways that can uh, reduce our dependency upon overseas sources of supply for, for, for electronics and also, um, you know, continuing the Moore's Law, the March Down Moore's Law, uh, new materials and new fabrication technologies around next-gen electronics. And then this, this idea of the digital tapestry in which digital data um, is captured and maintained and used in a way to make our products more more effective and more useful and um, and, and reduce the cost of uh, supporting them in the field. Um, again, real quickly, I won't go through all of this, but some of the areas that I, I find is fascinating now um, is the use of, of um, ICME and microstructure at, at various scales, being able to model and simulate these um, you know, materials at the molecular level and then scaling that up uh, and being able to predict how they how they will perform at the at the macroscopic level is is something that's really advanced um, you know recently that just is ex exceeds kind of what I would have expected um, going back even 10 15 years um, it's it's this is an area that's rife with uh, possibility Right to have a designer material that can that can do something that um, a you know a, a conventional materials even 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 composites which we think of being a new class of materials you know uh, has great promise here so being able to to, to do this modeling and, and and predict and then perhaps really uh, reduce the amount of physical testing that we need to do and get these new materials into service sooner, I think has really great promise. Um, and then, then just a, just a real brief um, look at additive. Um, you know, I've got uh, one of my, the areas that we are really evaluating is, is applying this ICME approach uh, in, a, in, a, in a loop process um, using physics to, to um, predict um, how, how materials will be, you know, can be uh, designer materials can be produced using um, some advanced engineering and and technology processes. So we're, we're looking at you know conventional e beam and laser laser powder based uh, additive, but we're also looking at cold spray cold spray and um, friction stir technologies. Ultimately, you know we're going to see improved products like there's a heat exchanger at the at the bottom right. So, so see things that couldn't be built in any other way, and we're going to see those perform in in um, ways that will improve our products and make our make our um, ultimately make our products cheaper and more effective. So that's kind of the uh, the R and D world, according uh, as I as I see it. And and the bottom line is that um, a we're all re R and D researchers if you want to get right down to it um, no matter what your job title is or will be when you when you if for the students who are going to go out into the engineering world um, my my uh, my advice and and I, th and I think it's a good one is to is to main that r and d mindset to 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 always be on the lookout for the you know for the opportunities to apply an r and d mentality and uh, add add value to the to the products that you're responsible for, um, and ultimately, you know, our, we're going to make the world a better place by doing that. So, so that's kind of it. It's it's uh, uh, it's it's been an interesting uh, thought process, and I'd invite you guys uh, all on the call to, if you have any questions. I think we have a little bit of time, and 
we can we can do that right now. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris. That was a wonderful lecture, and um, I think it's I, I like how you uh, provided the example in the beginning. You know, explained your, you. your title, "Life on the Edge," and uh, I think it's an important reminder for us to all maintain an R and D mindset in engineering, and um, also to consider the role of advanced manufacturing to reduce the cost of materials and, and products right. that we're producing in the future. Um, so I would like to uh, remind the audience that we have a Q&A panel available for your use. So if you have any questions for Chris, please go ahead and type those in uh, Q&A. And he's he's with us until the end of the hour to address any right. questions that you might have. Um, while, while, Chris, people, while, go, while people are typing, I see Bob's uh, comment. And, and uh, I actually I agree 100% with Bob. But... The, the the one thing that I would also say is that the F-35 is a product of our desire for an exquisite capability in which we repay anything for capabilities that, um, you know, ad, advance just even even moderately. And uh, and I think there should be a, a more balanced way of looking at it. And the F-35 is a great example where maybe a slightly less capable F-35 that um, was a lot cheaper could 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 have been the right approach. But uh, that's a good comment, Bob. I really appreciate that. Okay, go ahead. Any other Thanks. questions? Sure. So while we're waiting for audience questions to come in, I do have one question for you, Chris, and that huh? is um, if some of our students watching today are interested in a career with Lockheed Martin, oh, yeah. what's, the, yeah, what's the best way that they can pursue that? Sure. So um, Lockheed Martin, like like all the other, uh, most of the other air, aerospace and defense primes, and in the supply chain, um, probably the best way is, um, you know, it's pretty easy to go on the careers website in any large company and, and, and find a bajillion openings. But really the most effective way to get in as a student would be to uh, start right now, no matter where you are, and and look at the um, uh, the intern, um, you know, openings um, for summer interns or, or co-op students in some cases. And, and, and uh, if you can get an internship assignment, your odds of getting a, an offer um, when you um, graduate go up dramatically um, to the tune of something like 80 to 90 percent of our interns do get uh, full-time offers when they graduate. So, so that would be, uh, and the time to start looking for an internship for next summer is pretty much right now. That um, those those um, positions will be coming up on both on career web websites and in some cases we'll have uh, recruiters on the campus and I would encourage you to attend, attend those. But um, if you're if you're close to graduation, the careers website is is probably the best way to go and then whatever on-site um, events are, are occurring on campus. But uh, use your network. Um, I think it's really important that um, you start developing a network even when you're in, in college. Uh, reaching out to people that you know in the aerospace industry, I, I guarantee you um, people will make time for you. Don't feel that you're an imposition if you ask for 30 minutes for um, a, a person that you know is working in an area that you're interested in. They, they'll be happy to share with you and they'll help you out. So that, that network is something that you're going to build over your, the course of your career and um, you might as well start 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 now. Thank you. Great advice, Chris. And it looks like we have two audience questions that have come in so far. Um, the first is, can you elaborate about some tools or methods that are used during road mapping? Sure. So we, we, we have um, both uh, standard tools that, we, 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 that you can actually purchase. I mean, there's commercial off-the-shelf software that, that uh, we use. Um, and I'm and I'm drawing a blank on the exact name, but there's some that uh, Sharp Cloud is one, for example. It's um, a means of integrating data in 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 showing connections between disparate types of things. So so there are some software tools that we use. Um, a lot of them are just um, I think elaborate forms of of um, yellow stickies. That um, we we use to to create, to conduct virtual road mapping exercises, we we have found that um, you know the the virtual road mapping exercises that that we've conducted in the past, you know you would think the in person uh, uh, road maps uh, would be far superior, 
In some ways, the virtual uh, events have allowed more people to participate. So in the coming year, we're planning on a hybrid approach. And, um, and so we're going to use uh, our processes that we've, we've kind of developed over time and then, uh, and then layer on uh, a virtual participation uh, portion of that. And, and we find that to be probably the most effective means of road mapping. But road mapping, I, you know, I think it, it's, it's, as long as you have the right inputs from the right people that can define what the end state um, are in, in, a, in a meaningful way, um, and then you have a, a, a clever group of people that can um, you know, think outside the box, I think really the tools and processes that you use probably don't matter uh, too much. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're all learning to realize the benefits of virtual and hybrid uh, yeah, events right. these days. It's, yep. it's good. It's been a positive for you. Um, looks like there are right. two additional questions. The next okay. is, uh, thank you so much for an inspiring lecture. Could you please elaborate on the resilient logistics and sustainment under JDO functions? Yeah, I, I believe that um, I, I, I think the greatest, the, the best example of of a challenge with with resilient um, sustainment would be the supply chain right now in the U.S. Right, where where a and if you can imagine extending that into a uh, a scenario where uh, there was a, a you know a, a brush fire of you know conflict going on and trying to get um, you know, logistical equipment to to um, to that area. Um, an adversary could make that really hard and could break down essentially the supply chain. So so what what's um, what's meant there is is to enable uh, the 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 folks who are responsible for for getting fielding the weapons and getting them back into the into the into battle are are able to have access to the um, the resources that, that they need, and that um, that an adversary can't, by taking some action, deny deny that um, deny them that um, access to those to that supply chain. So it, it's a you know, and and information technology is kind of key to that, right? Knowing knowing what you need, knowing what's um, available, is, is key to orchestrating that um, sustainment in, in a contested area. So that's that's kind of what I believe that that, uh, that item means. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. The next question, uh, ICME has been very promising for materials design. Yeah. Yet there are challenges in terms of how accurate the simulation predictions could be given the high computational cost. What are mm -hmm. your opinions about the challenges and opportunities for R&D to realize ICME in the near term? Yeah, I think that I think that's why uh, this one chart that's just showing has has that process in a loop, right? That um, uh, you can you can potentially use uh, use your your testing or your results uh, to to help inform your your predictive and imp and improve the process. In practice, I've I've seen both um, startling successes and and alarming failures. Um, you, you know, there's a case where we tried to use some, I don't even think it was ICME, but some, some techniques uh, to do some fine element modeling. And, um, you know, it became too complex and we were totally unsuccessful. And, and yet, you know, I, ICME, um, I, we've seen some pretty good, good successes, particularly from a qualitative standpoint where we can get a, um, you know, in an improvement or um, a betterment in some way, and maybe not the prediction itself, not maybe not be the, the the most accurate, but yet we can still push push our performance in the right direction in a way that we can predict. So it's interesting. I know that we're funding a lot of this you know development work in ICME, and and uh, I certainly have high expectations that it will help me um, help us find new new materials and new combinations of. Uh, of constituents that can enable certain certain things. Thank you, Chris. Well, we have uh, just a few minutes remaining. If anyone has uh, additional questions, feel free to enter those now in the Q&A panel. Um, if not, I want to extend our, our uh, thanks again to you, Chris, and to our audience for joining us today in Life at the Edge, Research and Development as a Way of Life. Um, I know I'm going to be having R&D more top of mind after today's lecture. <laughs> um, 
So thank, thank you very much. And uh, this is our final lecture for the fall semester. And I want to uh, invite our audience members to join us next spring when we launch the, the spring Lunch and Learn series. Uh, we'll send out announcements via email and, and uh, list the events on the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute website as well. Um, so thank you everyone again for, for joining today and have a great afternoon. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Chris.